Okay, I think we're going to make a start. Um, so welcome everyone to the third in our Hopeful Futures seminar series, Enacting the Future Now. Um, my name's Jo Lansdowne. I'm executive producer of the Pervasive Media Studio at Watershed. And I'm also part of the Bristol and Bath creative R&D team who are hosting this seminar series. Um, I'm going to give a brief audio visual description of myself for anyone that it's helpful for. Um, and my colleagues will do the same when they introduce them themselves. Um, so as I said, I'm Jo. Um, I've got pale skin with freckles, shortish blonde hair, and I'm wearing glasses. I tend to smile and gesticulate quite a lot when I talk. Um, so the Hopeful Futures seminar series um, is a series of sessions where we're gathering together to think about sustainable growth, inclusion, climate emergencies and responsible innovation. If you haven't had a chance to see the previous um, sessions, they're available in YouTube, so please do go back and have a look. There's some really fascinating insights from our speakers. So today we continue that conversation, but with a particular focus on thinking about and talking to people who are working to put some of those things into action now. So I'm joined by Zara Ash Harper, Cameron Tonkinwise, and Mel Zawusu, each of whom will introduce themselves fully in a moment. We also have um, two BSL interpreters with us today, David and Harry. Um, one of them will be on screen at a time. They'll swap halfway through our conversation. Um, so hopefully if you need their support, they're there and you can um, just spotlight them for yourselves in your view. So the way that this afternoon is going to work is in a minute, we'll hear from our three panelists for five minutes with some opening thoughts. I've then got a few questions for them and I'm going to invite them to ask questions of each other if they'd like to. And then we'll open up for um, a Q&A with the audience. Um, so do feel free to, as questions occur to you, pop them in, in the chat. Um, I think you can use either the questions function or the chat. We'll make sure that we pick them up um, and put them to the audience. Um, I'll try to remind you to do that as we go. Um, but as I said, for those that joined us um, straight away, if you'd also like to just introduce yourselves and your work in the chat, please feel free to as we go. Okay, I think that's everything from me for now. So I'm going to hand over to a dear friend and colleague, Zara. That's me. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, welcome. Really, really pleased to be here. My name's Zara Ash Harper. Um, for the benefit um, of our sort of descriptors, um, I'm a six foot tall, cherry red, dark skin, African Caribbean black woman. Um, with the kind of Grace Jones erudite short afro haircut that you remember from the 80s, but I'm at the moment covering it in a, in a beret. Um, I wear gold round bottle thick prescription glasses um, and I'm wearing a pink crop top uh, with uh, coulettes. Thank you. Um, and I've got a big toothy grin. Um, yeah, and that's contained within a brown leather armchair. So that's me right here in front of you today. Um, I guess in terms of kind of sharing a bit about myself, I prefer to be known first as a person um, and that tends to weave directly into my professional persona. Um, but yes, my kind of heroes is probably the best way to kind of know who I am in the mind and the spirit. And they would be Audrey Lord, William Burroughs, Salvador Dali, James Baldwin, my mother, Judith Harper, what a legend. Um, my dog Colin, who's here in the background, in case you hear him kind of, yeah, making some noise. He's on his own mission of colonisation in the world. Claire Reddington, not gonna lie. <laughs> um, and Black Jesus himself, yeah. So I'm coming from a pretty eclectic place. Um, and I would describe myself first and foremost as an applied philosopher. Um, I've always been super interested in wisdom and plurality um, and thinking about difference um, and trying to understand 
how we blend um, what is different and uncomfortable with uh, what within us was or is, is inherently individual and uncomfortable. Um, and really I'm trying to create platforms um, and experiences where people get to show you the value that they see in themselves. Um, a lot of that means um, trying to create supportive environments that centralize love and care um, and really try and uh, centralize the unknown as the professional equivalent to the golden rule. Um, you know, to treat others as one wants to be treated within a professional environment is just an aspect of relational survival. And I think that so often um, I'm trying to develop young people or another generation in order to give them great experiences so that I know that my nephews um, have great experiences as creative black black boys on the rise, that they have great places to go um, and grow professionally and creatively and be supported. Um, I would say that the core aspect of, of, of my um, thematic approach to inclusion and innovation work is that love is the only thing that confounds death itself. It really, um, you know, it surpasses temporality, it surpasses our um, like reliance on matter um, and biology. And it creates something that I think allows us to be in service of one another and being together. But it also allows us to learn, I think, how to love parts of ourselves that we perhaps have not fully embraced yet. Um, so I see myself very much as, the, as an inventor of social technology devices. Um, so I'm really trying to, through love and care, develop an understanding of how best to support people to be themselves, but also how best, I think, to try and be accountable for the energy that I'm putting out into the world. Um, so I try to invent things like job titles uh, a lot of the time. So my last three job titles that I've invented, and I think that gives me a lot of room to, within my job description, come to an understanding of what does it mean to put myself into the, the service of others. Um, so I began as a, as a studio producer with Watershed like almost six years ago now, I think. Um, then moved into being an inclusion producer. I now frame myself as a creative director for inclusion, which means that I support people in developing programs, research um, and practices that help to create environments where difference is regarded as source code rather than as a Trojan horse. Um, in terms of like developing frameworks, um, I'm very much focused on trying to create equitable conversations between people who hold different types of power, who hold different types of lived experiences and bring them into a conversation that allows them to feel um, fully embodied in those and respected and regarded within those types of sharing. Um, yeah, I've, I focus a bit more on the institutional side of inclusion. Um, I've been very lucky to have a lot of social mobility in my experience and I feel it's really important to leave the door open and to share some of that understanding of systems and power structures to enable people who are independent creatives to be as informed and independent as possible. If we're talking about creative democracy, um, I'm very much um, on the proportion and representation side. Let's count as much difference as possible um, when we're trying to create new systems. Um, I also think very much about codes of conduct. I'm very interested in trying to support people in behaving differently, in knowing differently and being known differently. Um, so I try to lead by example and be known in my eccentricity, hence my uh, description of you, of myself to you. But I also uh, try and sit next to my name. Uh, my name means iridescent light in Arabic. Um, and I see that for me, my gift is the joyful abundance um, of interpersonal rapport. I love people. And I really like to inspire people to share the value they see in themselves and inspire people that iteration is sanity and actually risk is the reward. Um, and then really I try to live by um, a set of values that helps us to see that in the subjective uh, we come to understand our individual contribution and the value of putting our uniqueness in service of the whole. I mentor people, I also coach organisations and institutions um, and I'm really just trying to find what, what is the shape that I take and the space I take up and how can I put that in service of the whole? That's me. Thanks so much, Zara. Um, Cameron. 
Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name's Cameron Tonganwise. I'm uh, I'm a fifty-something white man. I look very much like a middle-class white man. I would have to say uh, I have a very dated part in my hair, and I wear mostly black clothes to indicate that I spend a lot of time in design departments and trying to do design. So I try to look like a designer by wearing these types of clothes. I'm speaking to you from a darkened room um, in Sydney, Australia. So I'm on the other side of the world. It's very late at night. My family are sleeping. We're still in a lockdown here because we've had a rather slow vaccination. Uh, so I've been working from home for the last uh, I don't know, 12 weeks, I think, as, as um, we've got variants running around. Um, so I, I work at a public university of technology. I, uh, I should also say, by the way, I'm speaking to you from Sydney, which is actually the, the land of the Gadigal language group, uh, people of the Aurora Nation. This is unceded land. Um, uh, I'm a, a person who benefits from a settler colonial system. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a, a lot of uh, returning of land and uh, um, reparations needed, uh, um, hopefully heading towards a process of some kind of treaty negotiation, uh, as, a, as a lot of black activists here are beginning to push uh, an interesting kind of move around what's called the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, and pushes for truth and reconciliation type uh, initiatives. So Australia is, of course, very late coming to that. Um, and so I do want to recognise, uh, yeah, and pay my respects to elders past and present in this land, people who have a deep understanding of how to be sustainable on this continent, uh, one of the longest uh, uh, sustained human communities on the planet, as far as we know, uh, immense amounts to learn. So... Uh, as, as I was indicating, I, I, I teach and research at a university, which is a very privileged thing to do and, and which I'll try and talk a little bit about uh, as we proceed. Um, the work that I do is very much in the applied design space. So I work for the Social Design Research Centre at the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, and we do a lot of partnered work mostly in the social justice and quite a lot in the criminal justice area. So a lot of what we do looks to the outside world like we are doing what's called crime prevention. So we try to activate communities to increase their autonomy. Uh, and the hope is that the work that we do by bringing design innovation to that type of uh, those types of contexts is uh, limit the need for policing and surveillance. Uh, so in a way, we're trying to um, move transition out of current systems of criminal justice to systems of uh, autonomous communities, um, while maintaining kind of lively and diverse cities around us. Uh, another thing that I've been doing, uh, and it was just mentioned, Poppy's mentioned in the chat, or that might have only come to the hosts and panelists and not gone to everyone, but um, I've done a lot of work with colleagues in the United States on uh, uh, a discourse and practice called transition design, how to use human scale designing to enable systems level change. Um, and we've taught that around the world at different places. We've, we've run courses, for example, at Schumacher College at Dartington uh, um, for uh, once every two years, uh, uh, three or four times, uh, and run various symposia on that area. And we try to bring transition design to the work we do here as we work with communities on doing this kind of social justice work. So I can talk about some examples as we go um, later on, but um, I'm really glad to be here participating in this conversation. So thanks. Thank you so much, Cameron. Um, I'm just going to mention that I'm I'm um, sitting in Watershed, which is for those that don't know, is in is in the centre of Bristol, um, right next to quite a busy walkway. So if you hear some background noise from me, sorry about that, but sort of not sorry. It's nice to be out and there to be a bit of other noise happening. Um, Mel's, can I pass on to you? Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Mel's Owusu, um, and my pronouns are they, them. 
I am a black trans masculine person. Um, I am wearing a white shirt with um, some black and blue and yellow lines through it. Um, got locks on my hair and I'm sat in a hotel room at the moment um, because I'm also speaking at a conference in Milan in Italy. Um, and so again, sorry if um, we hear some, what's it, that's hoovering outside and stuff, <laughs> but hopefully it won't be too bad. So yeah, a bit about me. Um, so this panel, I feel like is really interesting, this idea of like hopeful futures. And I was reflecting on why I feel so passionate about driving towards uh, a new future and why I have this deep sense of hope or even a deep sense of knowing that another world is possible. And I think a lot of that is located in my identity and who I am. And so, as I mentioned, um, I'm a black trans masculine person. Um, I'm also, um, I come from a lot, I, I exist at a lot of different axes um, of oppression in sense of class, um, in a sense of like neurodiversity, in a sense of just many things in my life. And especially with regards to my transition, I feel that in order to be able to live in a world where trans people, where black people, where people from different backgrounds are like able to like, not just survive, but able to live like a holistic, beautiful, enriching life. It means that we need to be hopeful about the future. It means that we have to believe that another world is possible. It means that we have to start working towards the other world. And that is essentially what a lot of my work is centered around. And so I'm a PhD student at the moment. Um, I'm studying at the University of Cambridge and I'm looking, I'm in the sociology school there. And I'm looking at um, the idea of knowledge production. And so something that I'll hopefully talk about a bit um, later on as well is that for me, a lot of how a lot of my role, I feel, in exploring how we can get to a new future is about knowledge. And I'm very passionate about the production of knowledge. And so I studied philosophy um, back in the day. Um, and this idea of epistemology, and epistemology is essentially the production of knowledge, how knowledge is created, validated, and justified. And so my PhD explores how we can look at alternative routes to, to validate in knowledge that exist outside of like the Western um, scientific realm of like knowledge production. And so exploring how knowledge from like the spiritual, how knowledge from um, the emotional, how knowledge from the erotic, how knowledge from all these other spaces in which knowledge can be created, can be validated within the system and how from that basis of a different form of knowledge production, how a different world can be born. Because if we're all thinking along different logics, it means that a different world is possible. Um, and then beyond my PhD, I also um, founded an organization called the Free Black Uni. Um, and so initially it's called the Free Black University, and we're considering changing the name to the Free Black Universe because of the problems with the university, but essentially the whole purpose of the organization is again this question of knowledge production. How can we validate knowledge that exists outside of university institutions that isn't within these gate kept ivory towers? How can we validate knowledge that is being produced in communities? How can we validate knowledges of like indigenous peoples outside of the current academy? And how can we also engage people from right across the world and it like allow them to see themselves as knowledge produ knowledge producers that you don't have to have a phd from anywhere or you don't have to be look a certain way your lived experience your your essence is enough to allow um for the production of knowledge and i i feel that when we allow and when we recognize like knowledge that is being produced at the, the corners of society, at the margins, is when we start allowing ourselves to recognize that a different future is truly possible. <laughs> I'm just going to take a deep breath. <laughs> um, I'm going to absorb the love in the room. Um, Okay, thank you everyone. God, I'm so delighted to bring the three of you together for this conversation. Um, I wanna start by asking, um, asking a question about, about kind of trial and error. Um, 
you know, I, I feel like um, I'm really interested in that idea of kind of good enough for now, safe enough to try. Like, how do we start to do things and, 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 and test them out? Um, but I'm really conscious that in a lot of the work that you do and that you're talking about, the, the stakes feel really high and that what good is and what safe might be um, is subjective and contested. Um, and also, as, as once challenged by Zara, actually, there's a, there's a risk here of pragmatism, of, of kind of compromise, which may not be the thing that gets us to a hopeful future. So, yeah, so my question really is, how do you find space to make mistakes in the work that you do? Um, and I, Zara, can I come to you first on that? Yeah, thanks as well, Joe. because I'm just like, I'm a brilliantly overflowing with just like adoration for both these two people who've, who, who came after me. Just sell, I just want to celebrate you both and the work that, that you shared, like really inspiring stuff. Um, yeah, and we feel really good that we're all on, on different, in different countries. So we're, I mean, this is, this is happening. It's really wonderful to hear. Um, yeah, Joe. just to kind of get back to your question, um, what I was reflecting on trial and error this week, um, and I, I, I wrote something very short, um, which was sometimes you learn through winning or successes. Other times you, were, you learn through loss or failure. In the end, we all win and we all lose, basically. That's life, as in that is the legacy of a life. And I think for me, the, the tension that kind of exists between sort of, I don't think about it in terms of sort of safety. I think about it where risk is the reward, um, the, the innovation and the kind of um, substantive progress. Yeah, because I'm not really into progressiveness as it, as it is. I think it's hubristic. And I'm not, you know, I'm not that much into just kind of substantive because I think, you know, it may be true, but it's also kind of a nothingness in a, unless it's subjectively anchored, you know. So it's more the two things together that really make sense to me. And I think that for me to accept the complexity of our world and of our experience, to accept that trial and error is really just... Um, it's, it's a process of innovation. It's a process of transformation that through trial and error, you learn what is effective, what is meaningful, what yeah. is relevant. You know, that is the point of iteration. And it's also to build, um, I don't want to call it a backbone, but it's more like a rib cage um, that is capable of surviving, you know, the blows of, of just kind of nothing suiting everyone at all times and that also being really important when i was looking at um some of the kind of words that you guys were using to frame this conversation sorry that's snorting it's my dog in the background um he's got a bit of a cold at the moment but um you you, you one of the words that you used there was um around there was around tension um and i think there is this huge tension between um sort of trial and error and successes that you can share and 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 play forward but i think actually being resilient in the face of people expressing that they need an escape hatch from even your best intentions starts to really build up this new understanding that we need to come to in terms of accountability around change, which is we are accountable for our intentions, for the experience that we're providing, as well as for the outcomes. And I think when we're thinking in terms of progressive liberalness um, within institutions, often we want to really heavily focus on the intentions um, that, are, that begin a thing. And actually the experience and allowing the, the, the record to show when people exempt themselves even from the best of our efforts and to record some of what has been previously erased from the narrative is really the responsibility of the institution because the individual only holds their own autobiography. But history is accounted for across like a very different set of vectors. And I think that we all need to really think about it. The way I've been putting it, and Mel, I was really excited when you were talking about um, your, your new name for, for your university project, because one of the things I'd written down before speaking was um, how are we understanding putting the U in universal. So to hear you talking about the universal, you know, the, the, uni the universe in this context, I think was very exciting for me. And last thing I'll say about it is for me, um, it's elders 
and I mean thought elders, that should be doing trial and error because we've built a certain amount of safety, security. It's the institutions that should be really working around trial and error more as it be galvanized in that way because they have some security. And I think that we should be creating platforms that engage and usefully collaborate with independent people because young people of difference across the board are the ones that give me hope in the future. And quite frankly, I could retire all my only job is really to support them in manifesting the realities that they're imagining because my my reality was very much more naive and post postmodern and theirs is something different i don't really even get it fully which is very exciting <laughs> thank you that's my answer <laughs> cameron i think i'm going to come to you next but zara can you just sorry to pull you back in when you rounded through it but can you just explain escape hatch it what you mean by escape hatch is a little bit more for us sure sure so basically escape hatches is a concept i came up with a, a long time ago because i was thinking about utopias and about how utopias are inherently um exclusive because if there are so many people who've been denied and i think mel's was speaking to this but also cameron was speaking to this in terms of the exclusion of certain groups of people from the structures that should be supporting them that should be edifying them and those people have suffered and survived a lot of harms that mean sometimes even when we're designing with the best of intentions we are creating um the experiences that disenfranchise them from their own value of themselves and their passion for their creativity. So we really always, when we're designing true inclusive programs, in my opinion, need to design for the anarchist who just doesn't give a shit, they're out. <laughs> Regardless, they like, I don't trust the man, I'm out. Because if we're not doing that, then we're essentially basically saying to that person, go to space, and build your community in exile. And it's fascistic uh, thinking. I was, I was really excited about this um, as a notion because I realized that designing inclusion in a zero sum context um, was essentially demanding that somebody, if, the, the, the person that is most far away from agreement with me will bend and fold to my, my vision. And actually, you know, some people just don't want a shared vis vision. So that's the point of an escape hatch, just like, so I can get the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of design and uh, design has always had this special kind of studio space for experimenting before making a decision. That's, that's always been its kind of superpower that it, um, it is a space of creative exploration in a protected space, this protected space of the studio. And um, of course, all of a sudden design is everywhere as a word uh, and everybody's trying to get a piece of design thinking and they want a piece of that safety to, to trial and error. And it has rolled out a little bit, but if you, if you step back, you start to realize that, um, you know, design only represents trial and error in terms of profitable innovation, in terms of people pursuing just business as usual. It's, it's the capacity of business as usual to try and fail. At the same time, there've been lots of movements coming that are opening design up to uh, more diverse audiences and the recognition that it should never be designed for, but always designed with and preferably designed by. And so what currently goes under the name of co-design has been an attempt to actually recognize that whilst the studio is a space of trial and error, it's actually not open to everybody. It's a it's quite exclusive space of experimentation. And as I said, it's, it's purpose is to allow trial and error with a view to profitability and, and business as usual. So under the name co-design at its best, it's a, it's a word that's also being evacuated of meaning quite quickly, but uh, you are getting attempts to recognize that part of the creation of a safe space is the way you invite people into it, who you invite into it, how you arrive into it. 
uh, and making sure that you are lending the capacity that design has for people to begin to uh, change their lives and change the society in which their lives operate. Um, that you lend those to people who, who have not uh, had such experience with that to date. So it's, um, there is a lot of rapid learning going as people try to open up the safety of trial and error to sort of co-design with uh, and even enabling design by the people who've been ordinarily excluded from what design does and how it operates. But I would, I'll make one last comment though, which is um, I think uh, everybody is a fan of trial and error. It's a great way to experiment and learn, obviously. There are lots of people who get to try and uh, fail uh, already. Uh, and somebody like me um, lives in a world that celebrates somebody like me failing. Uh, and I get to fail and there's no consequences and I can just carry on. Um, and so it's kind of interesting often to be uh, at this time uh, in which there are um, resurgent, necessarily resurgent uh, um, anti-racism to, to be, uh, uh, for example, a white man in this context. And occasionally I hear my colleagues saying, well, we, we, want, we want safe spaces to begin to learn how to deal with, with being settler colonials and, and, and being, uh, you know, possibly structurally racist or systemically racist. We, we need to learn how to do this. But there's another kind of response, which is, no, actually, the best way to learn right now is, is to fail and suffer the consequences and get the critique that you are racist. You, you don't, I don't deserve the privilege of being able to fail uh, to some extent, I have to suffer the consequences. I need to learn on the job of getting it wrong, uh, of getting called out by an Indigenous colleague for having uh, acknowledged uh, elders inappropriately. Um, and so I think we, we, will, we can often risk celebrating trial and error too much or we lend trial and error to the wrong people. I think it's a really powerful tool that our society needs to to give to certain uh, groups who've been disempowered previously. But I think for others, and particularly like me, um, it, it's time we started learning in the way other more disempowered people have always had to learn, which is uh, by suffering the consequences of failing and therefore being a lot more cautious in the moves we make, thinking a lot more carefully and not thinking, I just have the right to, to get it wrong. Yeah, thank, thanks, Cameron. I see my own and others' appreciation for that and, and for being so specific about, about your own mistake. And, and um, yeah, th thank you for, thank you for that, bringing that into the conversation. Um, Mels, do you have any, any thoughts around this issue of, of trial and error? I'm, I'm really interested in that notion of you both... Um, both founding the Free Black Uni and also studying for a PhD at Cambridge University um, and the kind of the, the possibility, I guess, for tension between those two spaces um, that I'd love to hear you talk more about. Um, that might not be right now. We can come back to that. But, but I'm wondering if, if that's an interesting context for this notion of how you, how you might try and make mistakes. Yeah, um, definitely. And I just kind of wanted to um, note that what um, Cameron was saying at the end that really resonated and I think it was a really powerful point to make. And it just made me reflect as well on um, the ways in which um, people like me aren't allowed to make mistakes and um, the consequences that are often paid like from a very young age and like the hyper-criminalization of um, black and working class um, marginalized people um, like right from the classroom um, and just re like reflecting on on the ways in which um, I was treated so differently to like other white students um, within those spaces and just how that continues through life um, that kind of continuous um, like like Foucault's panopticon, that like always disciplining ourselves, disciplining our bodies, disciplining our minds, so that we don't get into trouble. Um, and so that kind of 
in a way shapes and like unshapes, let me say, my relationship to change and my, my relationship to making mistakes, because it's something that I've really had to learn that I can do. Um, and that it is important to do and that every and like what even is a mistake everything is just a learning process it's a growth process um, and this idea as well of um, ensuring that we limit the harm as much as possible that our mistakes may um, inflict on others but also recognizing that in a society like everybody inflicts harm on each other and so even when um, colleagues might be called out as Cameron was saying for their racism it doesn't mean that like it's the end of the world it just means oh snap let me take accountability and get back to work and so I think being able to for being in a society where more people are able to engage with like their shadow more people are able to engage with the parts of themselves that aren't perfect because nobody is perfect and that that would allow the space for change and adaptability and the the possibility to make mistakes a lot more easy and being able to just transform the mistakes or like again just putting mistakes into quotation marks because not everything is a mistake everything is a learning process it's a growth process um and I also wanted to mention that um so I think it was Michael put the undercommons into um the chat so the undercommons is a book um, by Moten and Harney. Um, it's called The Undercommons Fugitive Planning in Black Studies. So thank you for writing that, um, Michael. And one of the things in that book um, that is said is that as we begin to move towards a different future, we'll begin to start seeing things um, differently, essentially. And so I really do believe that it's like a an inherent aspect of um, the current society of like a Eurocentric world to believe that everything is linear and that we need to know the endpoint that we're getting to and we need to walk this very linear um, and like rigid temporal road towards wherever we're going. Um, but what does it mean to walk in the dark? What does it mean to not know where our steps are leading other than seeing the one step in front of the other? What does it mean to to be able to be in that space of exploration, be in that space of unknowing and knowing that we might go one road and that might not be the road that we're meant to go down, but giving ourselves that grace and that space to move back into a different road and then continue walking and then recognizing that every single stage, we might get things wrong. We might not end up in the place that we want to end up. But to me, that's the only way that real change can happen. Because if we have these kind of hypothesis based ideas, like this is where we're going to, then we're just gonna continue creating more and more and more of the same. Um, so at this point, I won't go too deep into the Cambridge FBU um, situation, but I, I really will speak about it in, in a later question, because I think there's, there's a bit more to, to unpack there, so yeah. Okay, um, I'll come back to you on that in a moment then. Um, just wondering then to Zara and Cameron if there's anything that you want to pick up on and I'm, I'm struck by Vanessa's question in the in the chat also which which raises the issue of of, of safe spaces within within the notion of trial and error um, and how like what what does a safe space look like within the context of of embracing trial and error I guess is 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 how I'd paraphrase her question I uh, I would love to jump in if that's possible um I really am becoming a little bit uh stretched by a definer that is around safety because I think especially during what I call the corona tunnels um, that have been experienced by individuals over the past two years, um, it's very difficult to know how to make people feel safe, what safety means in a very uncertain, like literal 12 months in front of us. Like we, you know, I mean, you know, with the exception of the New Zealand, um, you know, premier and maybe one or two other global leaders, like it, we're all in a really difficult space knowing how to pitch and plan our future. So I really feel like the emphasis on safety um, starts to, again, slightly mollycoddle a liberal and largely white um, engagement with this subject. I think, um, you know, people of difference have had to strive and fight through a masses of, of a lack of safety. And I feel like actually it's for us to ask ourselves, you know, 
how well are we willing to be known? What are we willing to put down in order to um, support the, the creation of a future? Um, and I think uh, there was something that, uh, I think it was Cameron that mentioned this, which was around uh, being a white male um, and hashtag, thank you, Cameron. Okay, because you're also Australian, so, you know, extra points. And I think that realistically, um, it, it, it's something I come into a lot in my work is this notion of passing as in being safe to speak liberally and to signal liberally your like your values and what's important to you because essentially when it's done you don't carry that in the like li in the literal semiotics of your body in quite the same structural way as people of different tend to um, and for me I think that really we need to start encouraging people that to find their in, indigenous place of difference yeah I've, I've so just to give you an example Joe because we've been talking about trying to bring this into practice um, I created a workshop with an artist who does portraiture to support um, leaders of creative industry in asking themselves, what does it cost to share one's subjective narrative? Like, how do we need to welcome and support the vulnerability and the rawness? Because I think this is a more relevant than ever notion. Like, none of the institutions are the same. None of the artists and independent creatives are the same as they were two years ago when we kind of all left each other in physicality. And I think that, you know, re-engaging in a process of asking direct questions is an organization's duty before designing processes. Just as Cameron was saying, it's not as simple as even just saying we're going to co we're going to co-create things and we're going to make with, not for. I think it's like, let us find out who are we with and who am I? And how vulnerable and, and open am I willing to be um, in order to be properly catered for? Because one has to be, uh, one has to ask to be included, but you also have to take up an appropriate amount of space. And so for me, it's just to kind of, to touch on these two notions of like, where is the white man's, and I use that in a kind of, um, you know, normative way, like, you know, where is, where's the responsibility, I think, is to dig deep and find out that raw vulnerability that you can put alongside somebody else's so that you are safe, you know you're safe because you know that person knows you well. And that person knows you well enough to seek your security and your comfort and your care. It's like you have to teach people. I think the real question is, how do you respect one another? And how do you know and care for one another rather than how are you safe or how can one be safe? Because trial and error means we're all gonna up. I'm just going to put it out there we'll now and again like you know there are so many scenarios in which my heartfelt good intentions and ebullience is just like a misstep you know and I have to recognize that and learn from it but I do and I think that everybody has that capacity Cameron I wonder if you if you want to comment on any of that really welcome your 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 practical examples are actually because it really it it really helps to root some of this conversation I think in in terms of what does that actually look like in a kind of you know in per people together in a room or or not in a room um how do we create safety or or not but perhaps strive towards a kind of equity and vulnerability, I suppose, um, um, while working. Cameron, is that something that is, is part of your work? I, th I think so. I, I, th I think the thing I'd draw attention to is, um, obviously with a lot, of, a lot of things going on at the moment, there's a real urgency uh, and, and we almost don't have, sometimes there is the claim we don't have time to to make space safe. We just need to get on to like, like quick, we need to do something and, and we, we will get diversity involved in this because it's so urgent. Um, so I just wanted to register that as, as another kind of challenge to this. And I, I, it's always hard in a crisis to say, we're going to have to go slowly in response to the crisis. The crisis is the thing that's telling you to move quickly. Uh, and that's always when you kind of get the, the reinstatement of the kind of the systems of the status quo who suddenly feel empowered to take control in the crisis and will often manufacture a crisis for that. 
But I'll just talk about a, 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 another quick example. Um, so at one point we did some work trying to help the university deal with sexual assault and harassment on campus. Uh, and it was quite literally trying to induct new students into conversations around uh, intimacy and consent. Um, and of course the university you know, had a very like <laughs> risk management approach to this, but they did sort of turn to a design innovation unit. Uh, and, and so we did co-design with a lot of students how to start to have these types of conversations. And we kind of risked trying to create a, a playful conversation. Um, it, was a, it was ice cream stands. People queued up for a long way. As they queued up and waited, they had to have, they saw all this material and, they, and researchers would kind of talk to them. And, and in a weird way, they were kind of inducted into trying out uh, um, consent trying out asking for consent, uh, trying out having a conversation. And this was a very diverse student population. And so there were lots of sensitivities to do. And, not, and obviously the, the topic itself is, um, is difficult. And so it, we really risked the kind of playfulness of puns and fruits and ice creams and uh, the kind of the whole setup was that eventually you would get an ice cream, you get a bowl of ice cream but then you'd stand around thinking, I, I don't have a spoon for this thing. Um, how, how am I supposed to eat it? And you had to go and ask somebody for a spoon. And that was the kind of the, the tagline. And there was a real risk that we were trivializing this. And it was a real risk that we were proceeding by way of analogy. And it was so we suddenly, you know, we've had critiques that um, look, if, if you're going to deal with sexual assault and harassment, if you're going to deal with sexual intimacy and questions of consent, you need to confront that directly. Um, and so it was a really interesting attempt to kind of design cultures of safety that were not too analogous, were still in the space, did, you know, make direct reference to sexual intimacy and the, the pleasures of being on campus and meeting new people, just trying to create you know, new sets of rituals around how that would happen, um, what it actually meant to attain enthusiastic consent, what to do in situations without being a bystander. These were all the kind of difficult conversations that we were trying to help people have. Um, and so I just mentioned that example. We, you know, we won a design award for it, but that is no guarantee that I think we got the mix right between safety playfulness and the seriousness of having this type of conversation. But I do think it points to the fact that you have to almost risk how you approach safety and that you don't get a kind of commoditized model of what is a safe space, or rather that, that, that these are always having to be done with care that is context specific. And that the way you build safety in relation to this conversation would mean nothing for another type of conversation that you're having about workplace bullying or, or about trying to have a difficult conversation with a climate denier. That those all have to be dealt with in distinct ways. And, um, you know, the, the design is the science of commodifying. So it's always at risk of offering this one kit to every different place. Instead, it's a matter of always sort of building those conversations carefully. Um, but I just give that example of trying to sort of use a playfulness to get a serious, but then not allowing it to become a kind of distraction. Um, it was very tricky work to do. Which actually takes us back, I think, to what Zara was saying about the importance of knowing and being known in that, in that, that this is actually always a process of negotiation um, and, and kind of recognition and being able to to tune in, to ask and acknowledge where other people are at. Um, I'm going to come to audience questions in a little while, so just give you a little heads up to put some questions in the, the chat if you, if you want to ask our panel anything. But in the meantime, Mel's, I'll take you up on your generous offer to tell us more. <laughs> um, and I guess I've, this, this question, I, I suppose, is about kind of sites of change. Um, where you spend your 
where and how you spend your energies, I guess, um, if you're trying to kind of manifest this notion of the future within a status quo and, a, a, you know, existing hierarchies and institutions, um, how, you know, is it, is it transition or is it revolution? Um, and how do you think about that? Absolutely. So, yeah, um, it's, a, it's a complex one in the sense that I want to come back to, again, this idea of, well, this book, The Undercommons, which um, was noted in the chat. And in The Undercommons, there's this concept of um, fugitive intellectualism. And fugitive intellectualism essentially means being at the university, taking what you can from the university whilst being disloyal to the university. And so that's where I kind of position the work that I do at Cambridge with the work that I do outside of the institution. And I think it's, it's a case of in the transition. I, I see the world right now as being in a transitionary phase. And I guess we're always in a transitionary phase. We're always trying to get to a different, a different space, a different future. And so whilst being in a space of like occupying the present and noting that these institutions do still hold a great amount of power and they do have a lot of money, they have a lot of libraries, they have a lot of resources. And so I take my academic work um, at the university as this kind of fugitive study, um, using the tools that the university has, using the access that the university has to write work that is is against the university, is almost the antithesis of um, the Western institution. It's, it's antithetical even to, to the study of um, the Western Academy. Um, and so it's this kind of space that I'm trying to continually occupy, but whilst also recognizing that whilst I'm at the institution, there's still gonna be coloniality in my work. I'm still gonna think in a specific way. I'm still gonna have to meet the academic standards that I'm required to meet. Um, but at the same time, how can I push as far out to the edges as possible? How can I use this time with a full scholarship to have time to just reflect on the questions, to meditate on the questions that I think are central to collective liberation? There's no other space that I can see right now that would give me that same type of space and access to resources that allow me to reflect on those questions that I can then move out of the institution once the PhD is done and put all of that time, put all of that energy into um, supporting the community. And so that's where the Free Black Uni comes in and exploring ways that are outside of the institution. And so whilst I have one foot inside the institution, I always need to have a foot out of the institution, both for like my heart um, and for my work. Um, and so that's why it's, it's a tension between the two, but it's, it's almost, it's a process. Um, and I'm of the position as well, I'm specifically thinking about the university, that the university should be abolished at some point. And so why would I be at a place that I think should be abolished? Um, simply what, because of what I've just um, explained, it's, it's, I'm looking for the word, it's almost like a, the word that's coming to me is a necessary evil, but it's not even a necessary evil, it's more a, just a necessary um, maneuver. It's a necessary maneuver to get to the place where um, I'm hoping to get to and to write and reflect on the university in a way of suggesting that, well, arguing that it should be abolished at some point while still being within the university so that when I leave um, and hopefully allow these alternative routes of knowledge to kind of flourish and what with like more people in community outside of the university and then continually asking those questions but yeah let me just stop there <laughs> i'm super pumped and just like so in love i just can't i just can't i so was not expecting to come and fall in love with two two people in the middle of my day right what a pleasure um, just to kind of like to contribute, I think, to that thought, because I've been wanting to share uh, this particular person. Um, her name is Drusilla Cornell, um, and she's an academic um, who operates out of America. And she wrote this book called The Spirit of Revolution, which is uh, a discourse into sort of humanism, um, post-humanism, and uh, I guess the kind of masculine impacts within humanism 
And so she's very much looking at revolution and in that sort of Audrey Lord sense and in that sort of like reclaiming of knowledge sources and reclaiming, reclaiming of value. Um, and she says this thing that I just find so impactful, uh, which I don't know if this is helpful for you, Mel's, in any way, but she says basically that we we need to, when thinking about revolution or uh, restitution, be incredibly careful because it's like a boomerang that you throw out and the white man throws out the boomerang and he's the last person to catch the boomerang and we all are ready to get our heads chopped off as that boomerang returns. So before we seek to essentially punish the white man too deeply for the origin space that he, he has created for himself and occupies, we should be very, very careful that we don't all get our heads lopped off in the process of him recognizing himself. And I think it, it leads back slightly to uh, Cameron because I'm a, I'm a deep believer. I put into the chat this thing that I've been thinking about consequences. Similarly, is that they're really essential building blocks um, to an interesting life, to integrity. And I feel as though actually, like when we devolve ourselves from the common harm that you know we all create like they are as much a product of what we have not fought for as yet what we've not been able to engage with as yet like there are so many variants of this and this is an area where i know what i believe becomes very risky um because people find it a struggle to hear a black woman say the things that I truly believe, you know, I am a feminist because ultimately there is a structural skew, but I'm an existentialist if I'm honest, do you know what I mean? And fundamentally speaking, I want to see the white man who wants to change, who wants to add to the efforts that we're making, who wants to contribute to supporting my work and the work of other young people of difference. I want to see that person also valued and edified my big question is at this point, why we're not suggesting to white males in leadership that they mentor and support people of very much difference into leadership positions. One person has energy, one person has um, access to a certain amount of institutional knowledge and it lends itself back to what you were saying, Melz, which is the destruction of the university is kind of what you're about, right? I feel that way about the Arts Council. I don't, I don't want to destroy it, I want to dismantle it. Do you know what I mean? But fundamentally, I also seek funding from Arts Council and support others in seeking their funding. And so there is this tension, which you were speaking of, Joe, an inherent tension between systemic change, the hard work that it takes, the striving and the addressing of the issue. And I think for me, in, in the end, what I rely on is asking myself, where is the you in the universal struggle? Yeah, like we all just need to ask ourselves that question more frankly, you know, like Mel's is in a position where you're going to university and doing a PhD, that's the you and the universal struggle, the tension between you and Cameron is asking himself a bunch of questions about what does it mean to be a white man, learning lessons through and with indigenous populations, and what does it mean to be vulnerable, I'm asking myself, what does it mean to be a fabulous black woman just trying to stand in the truth of myself <laughs> and that's my inherent struggle <laughs> but i think we all need to ask ourselves that question quite publicly is my point um we're used to i think publicly asking people of difference to reveal themselves and not actually and it comes back to this passing sort of notion not actually being that aware of what it takes to put yourself out there when I did that particular workshop that was really about galvanizing people to think about the cost of sharing personal stories, what I learned was that people are holding things. I, I got sentiments back like nobody knows from, from white males who are at very high levels in, in institutional leadership saying things like nobody knows I uh, grew up in a caravan. You know, nobody knows that like I was homeless for a period of time. That's my truth. People never read that in me. So I think it really is about um, the kind of cost centers and the economies of scale of being known and community. And more than ever, we need now to try and make that um, a new and much more efficient and personal relation, customizable relationship. If they can bloody do it in an algorithm for Asda, they could they could do it for me. Thank you. <laughs> Headline takeaway. <laughs> um, Cameron, can I ask you to, to, to speak to this, this question? I guess you're working within, within a university 
um, for, for, you know, a design school, which I guess has traditionally come, perhaps come from a different tradition um, than, than a lot of the rest of, of academia has, but is still, um, but I guess has been, certainly in a UK context, has been um, adopted often as the way in which university research can be seen to have impact in and on the world. Um, and then, of course, you are a self-acknowledged white man negotiating some of these questions as well within that. So, um, so yeah, tactics, sites of change. Um, how do you think about negotiating that? Um, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll answer two ways, one about the university and then one about transition design. Um, uh, and, and my own education was in the great heydays of, of post-structuralism where, you know, the project was precisely at that point, you know, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, dismantling this institution of knowledge and kind of opening up other kind of domains, uh, you know, and some of the leading figures were also kind of founders of alternative universities. So even Derrida himself, you know, uh, helping found the, the um, uh, different kind of spaces uh, and even school education, you know, sort of sides to the project that often get forgotten when he just gets written off as a, a kind of uh, obscurantist kind of uh, philosopher. Um, so I grew up kind of my university education was in that phase. So I kind of went to university learning about the limits of the university, not in terms of its racism and colonialism, but, but in terms of its, its overall kind of uh, monopoly on knowledge. Um, and then sort of weirdly ended up, you know, in design, which as, as you've just said, is, is not really proper university. I mean, it was uh, it kind of entered the university only because polytechnics got kind of absorbed into the system and it doesn't really have a proper research culture. So it's, it's always kind of a pretend space within the university. And I think that actually means it's, it doesn't, it doesn't fit the usual structures. It, 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 um, it actually provides opportunities uh, that are not available to regular disciplines. So I do always find like I, I oddly ended up personally in something that's not quite a university. Uh, and then obviously have maintained uh, always a dual relationship to other projects that do try to counter the university. So whether that's, you know, participating in Schumacher College, um, the work that I've done with Tony Fry, uh, an initiative which he started a while ago called the Omatic University, um, which is now actually reviving, uh, particularly with some, some Colombian colleagues. Um, so these were all attempts, you know, very strong discourse that the university has proved to be completely bankrupt uh, in the face of the current of crises we're facing, if not actually the perpetuator of those crises, and that we need different institutions of knowledge. The, the point I'd make, which I'd sort of take from the little I understand about Mel's project is, I, I love though that there is the recognition that these alternatives still hold on to the, the kind of ideal of these hybrid spaces of learning. I mean, the university has been so co-opted and decimated by neoliberalism, that there's almost nothing left except the idea. Um, plenty of people who continue to suffer working in the institution are only doing it because of that idea. Um, and they're definitely not the ones managing the universities who seem to have totally abandoned that idea. But I think the idea itself, I mean, universities still remain something that doesn't quite fit with the rest of the economy. They're still engaged, in it, even though they charge tuition and kind of try to do research, that it still doesn't quite work. It never quite works. And I think that not quite working is still a possibility for resistance. Um, so, yeah, definitely I, I work within a university, but I, I, I work within a technology university in a really most applied sense. And most of our work we do is externally facing and um, and then, as I say, I always try to straddle projects that are also anti-university at the same time. And I think that's uh, the privilege of, of being um, who I am um, at, at, you know, at this point in my life. I can do that straddling. And I go back and say that that's, that's precisely what transition design is about. Transition design risks 
appearing to be more reformist than revolutionary because it's looking for sites of change. And those sites of change often appear highly compromised. And it's the, the risk of, of doing that work. A lot of the work that we do um, is, is what we call problem reframing. So rather than solutioning, which is what design's known for, a lot of the work we do is problem reframing. And organisations that come to us have intractable problems that conventional types of problem solving have not solved. So they come to us. And if you turn to a university to help you, you really must be at the end of your rope. And so they come to us, you know, in a, in a lot of trouble. And I'll give you one quick example. So it was a, a large logistics company with a very troubled background um, that I think a lot of us uh, thought a, a long time about whether we should work with them. They had a large contract uh, doing a lot of repair and maintenance on social housing, on all of the social housing in this particular state. And they came to us because a lot of the repair was um, damage and the damage looked like it had been tenant incurred damage. So that was kind of like criminal and we did crime prevention. So they came to us basically saying, can you help us get the tenants to stop damaging their property so that our contract doesn't cost so much money. So on the face of it, this is a terrible side of change, right? Everything I've just told you, they're a problematic company, their contract was too high. But they came to us and, and we sort of won the trust of them and the tenants to actually bring tenants into that process. And to begin to say, you need to understand that your tenants are partners in the care of this building. And the two of you share this kind of question of care. And if you, if you cast tenants as being the ones who are incurring the damage, then you can't prevent that because you've already coded them as being the cause of the damage. And that what you actually need to do is completely restructure your relation and start again. You need to learn to see these people as people. Um, uh, you need to actually engage and you need to recognise that they live and, and love the places they live and they want to help. The, the, you know, they're terrified to call you and report damage because they think you will classify it as tenant incurred damage and then they'll have to pay for it. So that's why these things don't get maintained. So I won't go into too much detail, but it was just a, it was a, it's in my mind, a really difficult decision about is this a site for change? The way we managed to reframe that whole situation, the way we managed to convince a large logistics company to completely re-see who they think their partners in this project are, enabled significant transition in, in what that social housing and, and its care and maintenance were. Now, that's, that's a great story. On the other hand, this just reinforced existing systems of social housing. It did not get more social housing built. It did not allow people to move out of social housing. You know, it, 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 it was not a transition design project. It was a problem reframing. So I just give that as an example to say, we're constantly looking for these sites of change. We try to find sites of change that exist within things that um, possibly should be walked away from. Uh, and there's always that attempt to try and work out how much agency is here, how much can we use. Um, and these are, these are difficult decisions to make. Uh, and, you know, we try to always make sure the community is helping us understand if we're making the right decisions. Um, but I just give that to say, in the same way that I sit inside and outside the university, we try to do work around transitions that are always making these where, how can you find opportunities for change, platforms for change, even within some of the problematic sites of the current system? Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. A really useful example. Um, I'm going to come to Jane's question. Um, thank you for your question, Jane. I'll just I'll read, read it out verbatim if that's okay, though I might avoid the bit where you say it's a small potatoes question because I'm not accepting your apology for what I think is an excellent question. Um, Jane says, so I'm an older woman in the majority culture. I'm struck by the phrase people of difference because it seems anchored to majority culture being a sort of benchmark. I'd be grateful to hear more about the phrase and what it means to, well, people of difference. Um, so I just checked in quickly with Zara about that, and she's she's keen to talk to that. 
what I actually said was, I'd love to talk about that um, because it was me that said it. Um, so first, just to say thank you, thank you, Jane, um, for your attention. Um, it is a phrase that I invented, um, as, as I've mentioned today, inventing things is something I do, I think, to, um, what's the word for it? It's like to essentially um, defend, um, you know, the hegemony, like all mass thinking, to defend from hegemony and mass thinking. Sometimes I'm not sure where these phrases are going to go or how they're going to be picked up, but they make sense for me and they're true to me so i use them and i i tend to uh like be accountable for these kinds of phrases in the moment as my truth and then i find that they get picked up where they do and people take them forward where they do and that's just a source of investigation and interest for me so the reason why i use people of difference as opposed to like when i'm talking shorthand about um, intersectional communities, right? When I'm talking about really people who are uh, consistently and, uh, and contemporarily still in a position where they have to um, shape their own inclusion um, unfairly often. I use that because I think for me, it's the biggest term um, that describes all of us. Like you, Jane, as an older woman in a majority culture, that's not me at the moment. You're a person of difference in regards to me. It becomes like a ratio rather than um, it being a sort of all encompassing uh, thought. It asks people to ask, how am I different? Am I in this group or not? Um, you know, for me, it's not enough to use people of colour alone because I personally in my practice have moved past that and seen the value of intersectional learning with people who have disabilities, with people who are neurodivergent, with people who are um, introverted as opposed to extroverted. Like for me, people of difference starts to speak to all the ways in which we are different from even the people we are differently um, structurally categorised with. So for me, as, an, as a black person um, who's been in private schooling often, who has Judith Harper as a mother, you know, it, it's a point of difference for me. A lot of black people have called me a coconut, have told me I'm not black enough, have questioned my blackness. I love that in this day and age, I am a person of difference, even within my black community. It's a way for me to really kind of understand and value my place of difference. And for me, it has meaning um, and an understanding. I can, it, there's a part of me that does definitely say you need to be confident to use that phrase confidently. If you, the more you associate yourself with difference naturally, I think the more natural that phrase becomes for you. The more sort of passing or kind of structurally identifyingly passing you are, I think the more foreign that that phrase feels for you. But I don't want anybody else to define my difference structurally. I want them to invite me to share my difference with them personally. So that's why I use that phrase. I think that you have to have reached a certain level of sophistication in your inclusion thinking to confidence confidently deploy it but for me personally I'm very very clear that I'm a person of difference and so is everybody else I can currently see on this screen and certainly everybody who's in this group right now is, is different in a way that includes them in my thinking about inclusion as a whole. Um, there are other ways in which I have to become more specific but when I'm talking about why I do the work, I do it so that difference is centralised and valued um, and that includes all kinds of people. I hope that's helpful. I'd love to have heard what Jane thinks about it as well. Like, everyone loves a conversation. Um, Penny, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on your question if that's okay. It, it is an interesting question, and and I wonder if we can, if we don't have time to come back to it, we can make an introduction. But I'm. I'm not going to go to it right now because I'm, I'm conscious of something that we sometimes refer to as the gravity of the university and I feel like we spent we spent a bit of time talking about the university and I, and I'm, I feel like your your question while it's good will take us back there and I'm interested to, to move on just now um, and I want to invite um, the panel actually if they want to ask any questions directly of each other. I'm not going to go first because I've got a million questions for you both. I've been really struggling to pare them down to one for both of you. 
But um, so you go first. <laughs> Cameron, I think Mel's just signalled you. <laughs> I, I, I had a quick. I, I'm, I'm keen to know more about Mel's um, uh, Free Black University. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, and and not so much it. I think one of the big challenges in, in projects related that that I understand is um, how to win space and time out of the rest of the world, out of the economy, for people to participate in these things. So one of the advantages of a regular university is that having stumped up the tuition fees means you've restructured your life to make the time to attend classes. So it's a very bad way of nevertheless people kind of forcing themselves to engage literally in a course of study. And so uh, often when I have been interested to kind of create spaces of learning outside that, um, obviously when people are really motivated, they'll make the space. But if people are partially motivated and then it's being crowded out by life as it continues, how to, how to help people uh, actually, you know, attend and participate uh, if, if that, if that motivation is sort of here and not here, I don't. That's, I don't know if there's anything. That's a really. That's a really interesting question, and it's definitely something that we're thinking through at the moment. But I, I often think when we consider, and that's why the name is kind of changing from university, because when we consider a university, there's still at the heart of it this idea of. Um, like, well, because of the marketization of higher education and possibly before that, this idea that a degree is a passport to a job rather than anything else. And so we come to the university to extract that or to kind of exchange our money for a different form of um, currency to then go and use on the job market. And so with the kind of learning and the exploration that the Free Black Uni wants to do, it's very different from that it's not going to necessarily be structured in the same way as a university where people have to come every um every week for this specific module and then there's a review at that it's not going to be like that it's trying to understand what is at the actual core and at the heart of knowledge production and that is that knowledge is being produced every single day and there's this cathartic process as well that i find anyway in the production of knowledge and rather than as it as a structure, the Free Black Uni being something that people have to like work really hard for or that feels extractive to them, it is hopefully gonna be a space that feels incredibly generative. And so people come not, not to add something onto their work um, schedule, but come as a space of healing, come as a space of exploration, come, come to a space where they can feel free. It's almost like recreation, um, but through the, the lens of knowledge production. That's what I want it to feel like, and we're exploring how to make it feel like that right now. Thank you for the question. It was, it was very interesting. The production of knowledge does feel cathartic. I've never quite thought of it in those terms, but yeah, I really recognise that. Um, okay, Zara. Right, excellent. Thank you. So um, I have a question. I'm going to ask Cameron. I'm just going to deploy the questions and then we'll see if we even get to them. But I more I want to gift my questions over to you as individuals than anything else. Um, Cameron, you spoke a lot about kind of what what do you have to share? What do you have to teach or pay forward? And that's something I think within my inclusion practice is like a, a first port of call to encourage organisations to think about what they have in abundance and what they can just immediately open their doors and basically use, utilise to reach out relevantly, um, you know. And actually it's a real brilliant exercise in people assessing their value to an ecosystem, but also coming into an understanding of what their ecosystem in, an, in a new context um, actually need from them. It's a brilliant exchange. But my question for you is, is that, you know, in regards to your own personal practice, obviously you're a busy person, like you're up in the middle of the night in Australia talking to the UK, you've probably got a family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so my question becomes in this time now where we are all quite spent in a lot of ways, and we're talking then about what you have in abundance, what you can lend, what you can share, how are you in regards to that, that particular 
sort of effort within yourself? Like, where is the you in this universal good that you understand? You can answer it or hold it for a minute because I've got one for Mel's too. Cool. I'm going to do Mel's. Yeah, <laughs> do Mel's. Do Mel's. <laughs> so, Mel's, hello. <laughs> So I really, really enjoyed um, like hearing about university. I just think it's such a brilliant, it's such a brilliant idea. And it's something that I'm hearing from a lot of young people who I know are like academically self-taught in a very rigorous way. And when I think about the canon, so we were talking about what's the value of what, what, what is pre-established as an academic because we, we're only built on the backs of the thinkers before us, of the academic offerings before us. But at the same time, you're at PhD level, you need to make your own inspired offering to whatever canon. And, you know, as soon as you used the word epistemological, I was gone. Like, if you'd have said phenomenological, I'd have been dead. <laughs> I'd have been dead at that point. My question is phenomenological, like, and it's similar in the sense that I want to understand, we're very good at making good beginnings we're not very good at making good endings and you're talking about an end that is in the end um you know destructive now i believe um in the big bang and the reverse so don't get me wrong i've got no problems with the destruction but at the same time you know as an academic you fall in love with a process and then you see the 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 kind of offering like destroyed in a in a certain context so what's do you have a plan as yet for how to make a good a good academic ending um what might you need to think about that as a person in the world like that, that's my question and i'll take the answers in the form of and i just clarify that do you mean an academic ending like within myself or do you mean of the institution within myself how do you ready your, it's like, you know, you, you grow up, you become an adolescent, all you want is to escape your West African mother and her power and influence. But then when you leave, you're like, where's my okra? Where's my fufu? Where's my mother? Do you get me? And you crying yourself to sleep. And the affection to, to you. With the affection, attachment in line with, you know, your ambition and how do you make a good ending? What I did was slam the door and say, mother, I'm grown up now. <laughs> it didn't work. But what's your plan? Okay. Cool. Um, I'm still, I'm still ruminating on your, your I mean, very generous question. The, the question. Uh, <laughs> and and perhaps, perhaps you can see the kind of resistance uh, that I, that I have. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a very privileged person. So, so I, I, um, feel the need to to keep giving without trying to keep give i suppose my only my only response is to say um yeah right at this moment i'm feeling incredible frustration to know sort of where to lend my privilege um you know we particularly went through this really interesting moment over the last two years of immense suffering but also uh, I thought it was quite beautifully phrased by Bruno Latour when he said, um, oh, there is a stop button. They told us there was no stop button, but there is a stop button. And they can push it if they want. And when they stop it and everybody stops, then they look around and they think, oh, you know, I can bake bread and grow food and, and I can begin to do, engage in the free black university and, and I don't have to commute. And uh, I find it, I find it so exhausting how quickly that That's has it. disappeared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And not only because the forces that wanted the status quo were f from the word go, making sure that it was all about bounce back because mm -hmm. they saw exactly what was there. So it was a kind of forced mechanism and, and the very entities, you know, who never suffered and in fact were highly profitable were the, were the status quo, but also just the number of you know, fellow Australians who got really nostalgic for the status quo, that what they missed was going to the movies and having a beer and watching sport and going to the beach. And so it's kind of, it feels to me like the world has, um, lost any ambition for change within the dominant kind of hegemonic forces 
and and have a nostalgia for just the most tedious suburban existence and and it's kind of like the world's kind of gone that is enough that's that's what we want back just give us that back and so i don't yeah this particular moment is just one of those moments where you're just thinking like um and that's why it's actually so refreshing to talk to the two of you actually i should say because prior to this conversation i do just sit there thinking i can't like where i said before you're trying to find these sites of change um, even within the enemy, you're trying to find these sites of change. And, and, and you've caught me at a moment at which, particularly in this country, resurgent racism and just climate-denying government and, and completely destroyed higher education sector. And I mean, I mean everything bad is, is happening in kind of mundane, dull decisions. And the response of the public is, can, can we just have beers and beach back, please? So it's so ex- it's so exciting to hear you like uh, yeah w- with the enthusiasm of both of you of those projects. So my response almost is um, uh, this conversation has been very beneficial. Thank you very much, um, and and I'll take this energy going forward. Yeah. So not quite an answer to your question, but but just thanks in return. No, thank. Brilliant answer. Thank you yeah. so much. Like mostly because I think it's really honest and it is how I feel it conjoins us completely as an inclusion professional I'm tired also and I'm confused also and disconnected from you know what seems meaningful also and to hear a white man in Australia echo that as a response to a question not because I've pushed the answer is actually quite like I said risk is sanity do you know what I mean the risk of asking you publicly that question has been rewarded because I feel more sane mate yeah, so you might have a cry later, but just know I'll be with you. <laughs> Mel, I don't know. Jo, have we even got time? We've got time, yeah. We, we've, we'll, we'll make this the, the final word. <laughs> no pressure, Mel's, um, <laughs> if that's okay. But seeing as you're going to speak on endings, it feels like a good moment to end on. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, for, thank you for, for the question, Zara. It's a really interesting one. And this um, idea of like having an affection to, to the institution, and I think that that is often the case. I was actually talking to someone earlier about like the affection that the entire, well, that a lot of the UK has to the monarchy. Um, and these institutions that essentially don't serve us, but the idea of them being so nestled within our hearts. Um, and so with that, what is my personal end? Um, and to be honest, I don't know. Um, and I feel that to even kind of conceptualize anything as like a full end is probably not what I'd want to do. Um, I guess it's just a transformation. And I think to, to be human, to have the human experience is to have affections to, to different things. And I love study. There's nothing that I probably love as much as I love to like study, expand my mind um, and think of new ideas. And the location that that happens in currently is the university. And so, yeah, I will probably often have like continue to have some sort of affection to it as far away from it as I try to pull. But again, like in a more cosmic sense, this isn't my last lifetime. And in this lifetime, I was a subject of the university. Who knows what the next lifetime shall be and then the next and then the next and then the next. So I don't see anything as con- confined to, to the timelines that we're all existing on. Um, there's just so much transformation that is possible in the world inside and outside of time. So yeah. I Zara's bloody mind, Mouse. I cannot. I can't. <laughs> just drop some bombs. I can't. So I'm not- say nothing about that because I I don't actually need to like I agree so uniformly with everything it's actually very overwhelming <laughs> I've already sent you an email by the way <laughs> but just to just to say like I'm glad that the question is not something that you have a fully formed answer to because that is hope and that is the not knowing right but I would also say to you that like strategy is not knowing but having a, a sort of a, a simulated plan for And I think it allows you to, much like a business plan, know what to say no to. Do you know what I mean? And I feel like my biggest, some of my biggest um, successes have come from knowing when to, when to always be leaving, basically, whether it was London or like I quit my job. And this was the last thing I wanted to just share in, in regards to what you were saying around an ending's not an ending. Um, As in, you can find us all online. Yeah. 
uh, slash in academic books because we're all really smart. But... <laughs> Sarah, I'm going to have to interject to allow our audience to, to leave and to just wrap up and to make sure I have a chance in front of them to say thank you so much um, to all of you. Uh, Cameron, Mel's, please do unmute yourself and just say bye if that's okay so that we hear all our voices at the end. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, the next talk is on the 14th of October. I think the details are in the chat. Um, I hope you take some of this, the energy from this conversation with you into the rest of your days, weeks, months, lives, future lives. Um, thank you. <laughs> Bye.